<laughs> I think we'll sit on the same sofa because it's yeah, come really weird me. to like. Well, you're it's my so friend, far apart. so that would be really odd if you. Can I sit on that side because they've made me take my earring out? So I've got okay. one earring in, and it's going to look really weird. Okay. Hi, everybody. Oh, they've managed to like stream our Instagrams, which is fun. Cool. Um, so I think like J we met like a year and a half ago, and all I really know is that you did a panel discussion for us, and then the next thing I really know is we were celebrating your 30th birthday in a Serbian restaurant in Palm Springs, and then the next day we were in Japan together. That's kind of like how our friendship forged. I recollect. When you say us, maybe take everyone through what us is and tell us about the female narratives. Well, uh, Female Narratives FN is a all-female creative agency and collective of over 100 freelance women that um, all do incredible things around the world and we work together to tell stories for brands and Jada is one of the many women on our collective that's doing incredible things. Jada is, um, as we were introduced, a mental health advocate and a plus size model and many, many other things. Um, obviously your Instagram account has over 2020, I can't even speak, 240,000 um, followers and I guess like w you sort of started it roughly around the time that you were doing your MA in child psychotherapy and I guess my first question that really interests me is when and why did you start your Instagram account and what were your original goals with the account? Sure, okay. My whole career has been completely accidental. So I started Instagram when the app had first launched. I was studying a master's in child psychotherapy and was working with a lot of young people that had eating disorders and body dysmorphia. And I couldn't quite understand why that influence had not been kind of spoken about in mass media. Um, why a lot of young people didn't see themselves represented in magazines or the fashion industry. And I guess when Instagram had launched, I created content online that eventually went viral, but what it meant to me was leveling out the playing field so we could create our own stories, reshape our own narratives. Um, my, so my first images went viral. They got picked up by um, the people at London Fashion Week, and I was asked to be the face of um, the first of a plus size show. I opened the show, and from there, my kind of career sort of grew in the fashion world and I kind of put my doctorate on hold and didn't go on and become a child psychotherapist. Um, but I guess that conversation that I may have had in therapy rooms is being had in a different way through the online platforms that we've built. So I think it's super interesting because you've told me like obviously in those um, therapy rooms it's very one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with a child and now you get to speak to so many more people yeah. through this platform that was just launching at the time. And as you said, like you, were a, you still are a model, but that was kind of, originally you didn't really see many other plus size women on Instagram and you thought, I'll put myself forward. My next question, I guess, is how has that, how has that goal changed now? Like is, that, is body positivity and plus size modeling still like at the forefront or are there like other goals over the years that have happened and, and why? And like, is it okay for us to change our goals? Yeah. Definitely goals change as much as like the platform that I'm working with has changed. You have to sort of adapt with the tools that you're given. And as the app adds new features, you're trying to navigate that space and communicate and engage with your online following differently, which I think a lot of the time I've like not read any business books or, or really researched this. It's all been very intuitive. Um, I think when I first started modeling, yes, there wasn't any plus size models in the UK seven, eight years ago. There, were, there was like a handful in America. Um, and the internet gave me access to see them. And I think, you know, I say a lot of the time, in order to know you can be it, you have to see it. And so a lot of the fashion brands that were out and the advertisements and campaigns at the time didn't show body diversity or didn't, you know, care about inclusivity and seeing like, and for the mass, you know, consumer like us to, they didn't think that we cared to see ourselves reflected in those spaces. They thought people wanted to see aspiration and that's what was selling. But we've kind of come to a space and through conversations on apps like Instagram and Twitter, they've realized that there's a massive consumer market for women larger than like a size 12 or whatever. Coming up to right to a couple of weeks ago when Nike put out the plus size mannequin. Plus size mannequin. Yeah. You took a picture with that mannequin. I did take a picture. I don't think it's on there, but um, I went in the Oxford Street flagship store of Nike. They had this plus size mannequin, which created such a conversation to a point where the mannequin was getting a lot of haters, which is really But it's bizarre. wild it's to plastic. me that it was even getting such, that there was such, still such an issue. And like what the issue that people had with it was that like it's not fitness because it's 
plus size, but that's insane because your whole plat, like you've run the marathon, you do more sport than anyone I know. Mm. So it's like, why did people have such an issue with that mannequin? So I guess going back to the point of this talk, which is how to be a positive influence, I think mark, uh, brands like Nike have realized that in order to be a positive influence, they need to be ahead and a part of the positive movement within advertisement, which is we want to see ourselves again. And um, I think the conversation and why it kind of got a lot of backlash was people, you know, kind of come up against change as something that's uncomfortable and there's going to be a lot of resistance and pushback. But within that space, a lot of conversation has started. And um, I think when going back to what you said re regarding goals and using social media to create change and have a positive influence, um, moving with like the times and adapt to what features are available, I took a lot of what I did, which was predominantly online and created an offline community. So my kind of career has been peaks and troughs of how I communicate and engage. So we originally took the conversation online and showed people what they could be in some sense. And then we took it offline. So last year I ran the London Marathon. I did it with a friend of mine who's a journalist and campaigner for mental health. And we ran it in our underwear to prove that fitness doesn't look like one thing, to reclaim our bodies and show that anyone can do it. Um, it took us a very long time. We didn't run it all. We plodded a lot of the time. But we still got to the end. Lots of croissants. With a lot of snacks, a lot of positive reinforcement, a lot of Harry Bows. But I think the point is that anyone can run a marathon. And from that, when, you know, it was just me and my friend that, that run this thing and, like, spoke about it online and had a great response and people wanted to be a part of that somehow, we then thought, how can we take this influence we have in this space and make it available for the masses? So then we created this event called Celebrate You. And two months ago, me and Bryony, my friend, we went and joined up with the London Marathon, basically hijacked one of their events called the Vitality 10K, and used our Celebrate You campaign to reach a mass audience and say, if you want to join us on this run, sign up. And maybe if you want, come and do it in your underwear. And I think you weren't maybe necessarily, I, I guess like the interesting thing is when you have this huge online community, how surprised are you when a thousand women sign up to run that with you? So yeah, we had over 900 women sign up to run it in their underwear. It was weird. It was crazy. It was remarkable. I was blown, like, I was, like, trying to hold, hold back some tears. Because there was women there that were, like, sufferers from FGM, that were women there that were showing their self-harm scars for the first time. There were women there that had never, ever accepted their, you know, post-baby body. And these people were there in their underwear, brave enough to just be like, you've inspired me. And seeing the numbers, like, I get desensitized all the time that there's, like, 242,000 people that look at what I post. Well, obviously, the Instagram algorithm doesn't let me reach all of them. It's, like, 10% most of the time. But that's the amount of people that follow me. And, you know, I put up a story saying, like, I'm going to be here and talk to you guys. And there's, like, what, 10,000 people that are watching. And I'm like, do they care? And it's, like, numbers a lot of the time. But when you see them firsthand in a space that you've curated, that's powerful. And I can't really distill it down to like a certain thing, but being authentic. And I know that word's thrown around and it's super like, oh, be authentic, be your real self and stuff. But I think authenticity is talking with purpose, it's finding out your why. So whatever company you have or whatever space you're talking in, it's like, why are you saying what you say? What's your narrative? How, does it re how is it consistent across all platforms, whether it's on Instagram, through a visual? And is that corresponding to your narrative on Twitter um, because people can see the flaws and pick apart the holes and like when there's points in my career where I've changed and I don't just talk about body positivity now it's about mental health and a, and now I'm moving into a space of fitness and reclaiming your body in a different way I think it has to still have that sort of same thread of integrity throughout everything and maybe it's a case of writing down your five or four principles of what your company stands for and going back through every task or thing that you do to see if it, it meets those points. And that that threads through everything that you mm -hmm. do. And it's really interesting what you say about like those people coming into like real life spaces because even when we host events and we don't do them that regularly, but when we do this panel discussion that you um, were involved in, you know, even though it's like four women and a moderator and an audience not as big as this, it's like 50, 60 people at the W in London, like that feels so powerful to have those people physically in that space and engaging and talking yeah. and the conversations that we have afterwards. And like, we'll be here afterwards to chat as well. 
um, is just like super fascinating to me. But I love something you said earlier, which was that like, if you um, post something that isn't authentic to your story and doesn't make sense to your whys, that your engagement drops, that people aren't interested in that thing unless you are passionately interested in it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people can really see through the gaps and they can see if you're like, Chatting rubbish, basically, um, and you know, and it's hard because sometimes you want to trial out a different approach. So um, I started a podcast called Unsubscribe, where I wanted to distill all the information and um, advice that I'd been given over the years from incredible women that I happened to meet, or I like stalked on Twitter and was like, "Can I like meet you and be your friend?" Or like, "Can I just take you for coffee?" Um, and I managed to like get the first youngest black female publishing director of British Vogue Vanessa in a room with Kingori. me She's to talk been. about Vanessa Kingori, to talk about how she got and built her career in the Condé Nast industry for over 10 years. And it's like, I can have those conversations now, luckily enough, because I don't know, maybe my approach is different, but how do we then give the mass audience that? And I didn't know if it was gonna work. Maybe they only wanted to listen to my voice, but being able to just take the risk and trial and test some, sort of, some I guess, yeah. new avenues of work is important as well. Um, let's do another question. Um, I guess our whole thing is about social impact technically is what we're supposed to be talking about. But I think in an age when there is so much to fight for and so much to support and so many things to get behind and like the amazing work that Greta Thunberg is doing and or you might be like overwhelmed by so many different things. Like how do you, especially with a platform like yours, how do you pick and choose like this is what I, um, I'm gonna focus on and this is what I'm gonna support? as a um, cause? I guess it would come back down to why. Yeah. Why is it important? Why do you care? And what's gonna be sustainable? So are you going to talk about your why and you'll fight that cause for a long period of time? Like, is there c real conviction in what you're standing for? Is there longevity? Like, what change do you really wanna make? Is it you wanna just jump on a bandwagon and like, you know, create awareness because it happens to be the right time? you can do it. But when I see brands like that, that put up crazy advertising campaigns like Zara or um, ones that just jump on certain hype, you can tell when it doesn't translate right. And you're like, how many levels of management did how this many go people through? I've seen so that many That it's been campaigns. approved and it's, and it's not the message. This is really weird. Like why? I always think of this like next campaign that came out last year that was like thrashed by um, the media where they did a thing for Mother's Day where they had a sort of panel of C-list celebrities decide who the best mum in the UK was gonna be, like powered by Next. Yeah. And they paid loads of money for it and they obviously like already decided who their winner was gonna be. And then they started trickling it out on social media, the beginnings of it. And then every mum in the country was like, what is this, there's no such thing as best mum. Like we're yeah. all trying, this is ludicrous. Like how yeah. can you even decide? And they immediately pulled it and were like, oh, like, sorry, this is this was really terrible. This was, a and it's like how, what board did this sit on for some, like obviously, I guess like what I always talk about is diversity in the boardroom and having women at the table because if there was a single mum in that room, she would have been like, hang on a minute, it's a Absolutely, bit weird. yeah, absolutely, having that standpoint and being able to share your real, your, your real truth, right? So a lot of my campaigns come from a place of experience or come from a place of, um, I don't wanna say like, you know, something that maybe has tragic has happened or something that is a real life experience that I've gone through and that I think I can then relate to the people that I'm talking to a bit better. Um, or like I've, I'm an ambassador for Young Minds Charity. It's important for me to work within the mental health space, but particularly with young people. That's what my master's is in. That's what I clearly care about. So it's aligning yourself really cleverly to things that are, you know, that your consumer or the mass audience is gonna be like, oh, that makes sense. I can see that happening, it's real. Yeah, I think that's like a big point that we're trying to say is those like authentic collaborations, both for you and for the brand. Like yeah. it has to make sense for you to collaborate with that brand for your own audience. Like Absolutely. you wear, what's the name of the brand, the bras that you wear when you do the marathon and all that? Alomi. Alomi, yeah. so like you know that brand, you've worn that and you can say like a woman with a larger bust, this will work for you. Yeah. Rather than just like jumping on any brand that's like, hey, we'll pay you. Cause I'm sure you must get offers left, right and center of people saying like, can you just like plug yeah. this brand hashtag yeah. ad? But you're very much like, this has to yeah. work for me. Um, and then 
the brand should also be doing the same thing. Like, why are we working with this person? Does this make sense? What yeah. is their community? Like, how is that making sense? Yeah, and the thing is, I think uh, what was really surprising is that brands really respect that. Yeah. So as um, an influencer or whatever, by saying, I don't know, I'm taking on a new swimming challenge now, and Speedo wants to send me some swimwear and be like, can we collaborate? Can you wear our product? I'm like, can you send me the product? Can I test it out to see if it actually works? Can, does it fit me? Does it sit right? Does it support everything? Um, because there would be nothing worse than being like, wear this, wear this, wear this. My, my audience who trust me will be like, I've bought it and it's completely rubbish. Um, and then a lot of the time I'll get questions from girls that are like, you know, I've found you again. Maybe they unfollowed me or followed, refollowed me or, you know, subconsciously I'm in their subliminal to say, I know that person on Instagram, I'm looking for a wedding dress. Maybe she would know because she's so immersed in that space. Or oh, I need a new sports bra. I'm going to come back to her. So that's what you want to do. Really create those strong impressions that even if people forget your brand or who you are or what you stand for, they'll kind of subconsciously come back because they trust you because you've built that reputation. And it's really like it's important to work with brands that that makes sense. Like we even like can't, the point is like there's so many brands that you've turned down and said no to yeah. to be able to work with the ones that you do work with. Uh, final question, um, I guess like through Instagram, which is obviously a deep, dark place sometimes and can have um, all sorts of crazy negative effects, who are the kind of accounts or people that really inspire you in different ways? Like, I don't know what they might be talking about, but different like sort of Instagram accounts that you think are really rad. Um, at the moment, I'm loving Greta Thunberg. I think she's super cool. I think for somebody so young and the work and that she's pioneering. She's like a front runner in her space, but also her conviction as someone so young. Mm. For me, that's inspiring. Cause I'm like, if she, if we all had that sense of like ignorance to we can achieve anything, we would achieve anything. Um, but I read this stat in Psychology's magazine only recently that was like 45% um, of people turn down taking a new career path and would rather be comfortable and, and upset and content rather than have the fear of starting from the beginning and being an amateur. Cause that's uncomfortable and a bit scary. Now, Especially as that's an adult. Half, that's half of us. And like seeing somebody like her is really remarkable because it's like that fearless, childlike curiosity and courage that I, I really want to kind of take some of that energy from. But I think on that, that's what you do so well is you show people that, yes, I do have things that I'm good at that I could stick to that and just do that forever, but I don't swim or like I've never really run before, but I'm going to run the marathon to show you that like someone that's a complete beginner can do this journey and get yeah. to the other side. And I think from that, I, th I guess it comes down to humility. And I, that's what I like to see within brands, like clear, like transparency with their advertising campaigns, if they get it. So a lot of the time, if a brand gets like a campaign wrong, they just pull it and they don't give a statement and they don't explain why something like that's happened. Whereas if a brand maybe came out and said, you know, I, I kind of, we messed up, we didn't really do our research. And from that, what we're gonna do is like you said, bring more mums into the boardroom to consult with us. Then I think that apology and that sort of sense of vulnerability gives them power. And that is what I guess is like what I'm trying to do more within my networks and the platforms that I'm working on. So with like our whole thing being about activism and social change, um, that can seem like quite a big and scary concept for people to get involved in. Like, how do I become a social activist? Um, what would you like give us some examples of like small ways that people could do things? Like, obviously your Instagram picture is blue for um, Sudan and I th that's just like a tiny awareness thing that lots and lots of people, no matter how big their following is, can get on board with. But there are many other ways that people can um, create social change in their own way. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, having like the, at the moment, um, the blue icon, which, you know, politically, I don't know the ins and outs of the situation, but a lot of people don't even know that that's a, an issue, what's going on in Sudan. So having that up there, it starts the conversation of why is that blue? And then maybe they'll go and research, why is everyone's things blue? And, you know, even if they just get the top line story of what's happening, maybe that will cause them to have some effect. Um, I think a hashtag is a great way to build a tribe, to find your tribe, but also to build a tribe. If there's a certain cause, like the Celebrate You campaign, it was a hashtag. People that wanted to find out a bit more could just find out through imagery or the Twitter conversation around that hashtag. Um, and yeah, I think there's like, there's so many ways of creating social change online. And I think there's three, there's, well, there's quite a few, but like 
timing is one of the things. Being ahead of the curve and adding value in what you're doing. Is your, is your content adding value but being relevant? Um, is it something that other people want to jump on board and repost? Does it want to be reshared? Um, one of the things you were telling me earlier that I really liked, which I hadn't even thought of, was the power that you have to be vulnerable on social media, regardless of your following. Like, if you share your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the likelihood is that probably somebody else is feeling what you're feeling. Um, there's a lot of mental health campaigners that I follow that are either activists because of their past traumas or whatnot, or because it's just something that they believe in and somebody else maybe that they know has been personally affected. Um, but there is, there is power in vulnerability. Brene Brown, who's an incredible speaker, um, who I love and read a lot from, she talks about that, like being vulnerable, but with boundaries. Um, you don't have to, I think a lot of, you know, it's quite common that people want to divulge all their whole story. But if there's like boundaries within that space, then I think it's quite interesting to see somebody be vulnerable and share their journey live with us, you know, over months, over years in a space like Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess and that's like for the individual, but for brands, like what are ways that they could be making more kind of authentic, positive um, impacts? Mm. And do, it, I guess like our big point is, do we see like an end to the era of the blogger and that whole concept of, I'm just gonna like post pictures of what I'm wearing and my makeup and where I am. And it's so like, most people can never afford to go there or afford those clothes and it makes people feel bad. and what are they actually adding to society? And I think people now with like the dawn of Greta Thunberg and stuff are going like, okay, that's great that you're in Cannes wearing this dress, but like, what are you doing? Yeah, but I think now it's like Instagram, in, well, I know that's the world I know the best, but things have changed. So like in the very beginning, we all loved those filters. So we would like use the Instagram filters and be like, whoa, this is really cool. And then it came to really curated feeds that were really high res, that looks really um, completely refined, sometimes really monochrome and minimalist. And that was what was really in. And now we want things just immediately shot off your phone. So yeah. mine has like a mixture because I like a bit of both. But things that are like, you know, you're at an event and you're putting it out without any filters, without any airbrushing, which is what I stand for anyway. And it's, it's weird how that's what we want to see. And like, it, you know, maybe the fact that we've got Instagram live and we've got Instagram stories, it's like that immediate connection to your audience that we want to see. We want like, we want to tap in. What I find is my followers want to be able to tap in at any point to see what's going on in my life when it works for them. The same way our viewing with TV and, you know, on demand, Netflix, iTunes, iPlayer, like we want to see what we want to see when we want to see it. And I think that's the way we're consuming content at the moment. And maybe brands need to do a bit more of that, like take us behind the scenes. Let's see how you manufacture. We're now in the time of right. like conscious consumers, right? So we want to so see So it's everything. not this like super polished thing. And I think that's the beauty of stories works. now and things that you can, you can still have quite a curated brand feed, but then you can have like your Insta lives and your stories that sort of take people a yeah. bit more behind the scenes. And like, you can have that in highlights and do really interesting things. And I think, I guess what I'm saying with brands is that they should learn how to tap to these communities and figure out like the influences and the people that they're working with. Like, what do they really stand for? Are they just working with them because they have a million followers and they're um, yeah. famous? Or is it because they stand for something and they're working on something really cool. And if they are working on something really cool, rather than just like getting them to wear their clothes, it's like, how can we support you in this thing yeah. that you're doing? Or, oh, you're gonna swim serpentine. Like, how can we be involved and do something that makes sense for that yeah. community and like give back? I think people are coming, uh, becoming a bit more clued up on like, you know, having your following number before, and maybe it still happens to a degree now. It's a social currency to a degree. But what I think brands are missing out on is the opportunity to tap into like the real grassroots influences, which takes research and it takes becoming quite immersed in, you know, say, for example, the fitness world. The fact that we've done the marathon, we're now, we did the Vitality 10K campaign and now we're moving into the world of swim and swimming and changing fitness in that space. It's like, who are those people that are shouting the loudest with the smallest numbers? Mm that are going to get that engagement and that complete like crossover and um, getting those followers to 
buy into whatever you're saying. That takes research, but... And that have that real community. Like, yeah. you introduced me to Charlie Dark, who's this incredible person that runs Rundem Crew. And I don't even know, like, how big Rundem... It's like a running community in... Who I trained up with when I was doing the marathon. marathon. And they always, like, hang out at the marathon and, like, high-five everyone, and they're allowed onto the running path to, yeah, like, yeah, hype yeah. people up. They're, like, everyone's hype man. And... Um, I don't know what their Instagram following is, but they're like in real life community. I was fortunate enough to go to one of their runs and like the atmosphere and the vibe that they had before and the dozens and dozens of people that come to them. It's like so powerful and raw and cool and like in real life. And back to our original thing of like when you get people in that physical space, that's amazing. And I think, but not only that, he may have only, I think it's like 17,000 followers online, but he's got over 10,000 people subscribed to his running club. Right. He also is connected to, I think, like 96 places around the world. So when I was in Australia, he said, you know, hit up this running crew, go and connect with them, go run with them. And he's they're so all well connected internationally and, and globally. So 17,000 followers, you'd kind of, maybe as a big brand would be like, oh, I don't want to work with them. But actually they're doing a lot of great work. Right, so it's, it's like you have to do the work as a brand and like, dig in and actually see like are people going to their events like what is their what does their community look like and yeah. I think obviously female narratives is a good example like we don't have that many followers because we just started two years ago but um, we like when we get people together it's really like a beautiful thing and we just did a shoot with 50 people and um, it's going to be plastered all over London in September and there's there's just like really cool stuff happening that I think brands need to sort of like dig in a bit and find yeah um, and I even if you are a brand and you're coming up like you're trying to build something yourself, it's like immersing yourself in your space and knowing like who are the people that are doing what, like know the climate that you're trying to be a part of and, um, and question it and see how you can add value, real value in that space that's like authentic to you. I think there's like this coined now phrase of micro influencers, which I thought was like an interesting word, but it sort of like downplays what they're really, it, I just think it's like people that are actually doing amazing things in their communities in real life. I think we're running a little bit low on time and I really want to get the Slido questions. Hopefully someone has asked a question. There's this app called Slido and you can like ask us questions if you have any. Um, so yeah, maybe we could do some questions. I don't know if they come up or how it works or if anyone's asked us anything. Or maybe you guys can just shout out and oh, ask us here. No, no, they're <laughs> down here. Um, what do you think are the challenges of influencers to go beyond superficial content? The challenges to go behind it, right? So if you're adding someone, just to it, I think it is really hard to not play it safe. And like, I have this problem constantly where I'm in two minds of like, I have to be sort of saying the right thing and doing the right thing. But when I have like a strong opinion that's not necessarily political, but kind of something has happened to me as a woman that I want to shout about on Instagram, I feel like a lot of pressure to not say it from different kind of vested interests. Like maybe I have clients that follow me or maybe family follow me or maybe I have friends that don't agree. And it's really like difficult to decide. Um, so yeah. like I end up, then I end up going, oh, well I should just like play it safe and I can't be bothered to do anything. And I have barely any followers. So I don't know how that. I mean, I just stuff. believe if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. Right. And I think the most amount of work has been when I've said, that's not what I agree with. This is what I work with. This is what I'm gonna do. And that's when people are like, yes, I completely stand with what you believe in too. Um, I, yeah, playing it safe means you become a diluted version, in my opinion, of yourself. And then no one really knows what you care about. Um, yeah. But when, wh what do you do with like negative press, I guess? Like with Instagram, there's so many people that get to sit behind a kind of wall of safety from their screen and say all sorts of things to you. I know you have a thing where you're like, you have to take the good and the bad and never get too caught up on either, but yeah, it's got to be like tricky when, if someone says something that disagrees with what you're saying and that gets like several likes or that gets traction. Yeah, I mean, I think when brands don't want to work with you, that's a great opportunity for n brands that actually are aligned with your values to step in mm. um, because then it makes sense. So I recently was asked to go on a show called Love Island, which is like a reality TV show in the UK and be like the plus size model to represent body diversity on like ITV, which is the main terrestrial channel. And um, I turned it down because representation isn't just one person in a space filled with like idolized body and beauty standards. Um, I feel like that's the tokenizing that we talk about where it's like Love Island, which has like an issue with mental health and the people coming off of that show and like several, unfortunately, suicides off the back of that show. Yeah. 
it's like you can't just try and like put a plaster over it and be like, well, here's a plus size girl, like we're fine, we don't have a problem with mental health, like yeah. everything's cool. We're giving yeah. everyone four counselling sessions when they come out of yeah. Love Island. It's but like the thing is, you're going to be missing out on like millions to work with a fast fashion brand, but yet then you get the opportunity to work with some other incredible brands that actually support what you believe in. Yeah. And it's like knowing that, you know, it's for a lot of people and, you know, for somebody like me, oh God, I could just make X amount in one year and call it a day and, I don't know, retire and go back to my life. But like, you have to live that's not the long game. That's not the long game as well. Yeah. Uh, other questions. Uh, what is the biggest away. challenge when you started being an influencer at the beginning of this path? What was the biggest challenge when you started being an influencer? I think the beginning is the best because you don't really know what you're doing. So the challenge is, so I never thought I was doing anything because 240,000 people were gonna be watching or, you know, at the time I had like one, one two followers, my mum and my dad, um, and maybe my sisters. And, you know, you kind of big family what you so love. Really like I actually do have a big family, so it's probably 10. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, you just kind of say what you wanna say. And so the challenge there, there isn't any challenge because ignorance is bliss. You don't really know what you're doing and you don't really see the pattern of what's having an effect and what people are tuning into the most. I think the biggest challenge is when you're going through transition and that's when you've kind of hit a peak and it's like the right time, the right point in the economy where your message is really, you know, prevalent. And then you kind of are like, what's the next step? How do we grow from here? How do we adapt? But how does it still align with what I believe in? Right. And that's when you have to sort of step back. And like, I, for a long time, would like stop creating content. Because I'm like, how do I do this differently? But also, how do I keep up with the ever-evolving tech that we're working with? And so that's, I think, the biggest challenge. And you know, every company, I think, has to do it. There was a massive article I read about Polaroid that they didn't keep up. And it's like, and that's why they had to sort of reinvent the like use of Polaroids as like a vintage live camera to now being something that's like, it's nostalgic, it's fun, um, it's like a new trend. So it's like, uh, it's like a life, it's, yeah. It's like you, you, have, you have to keep moving. It's like your lifetime. It's like you're never gonna be, you know, number one. I think that's what people forget a lot is that we're all people, right? And so naturally like our interests might change or they might evolve or we might have new goals mm -hmm. and like new things, which is kind of was my first question. Uh, to remind people that it's a bit like musicians and when they make a different album and people are like you've sold out and it's like but I've just changed my interests and this is what I'm really striving yeah. for now yeah. and I've grown as a person and this is like where that direction is going but with Instagram it's tricky because you have all of these followers that are there for a particular reason like they've come on board because you're this like plus size model and that's what they want to see they want to see modeling pictures and then if you're trying to like push this mental health agenda to people that haven't signed up for that yeah. you kind of just have to like evolve but then you get new followers that are Absolutely. interested in that and yeah. you keep shifting yeah. yeah you'll lose some but then you'll gain some exactly um what else is on here that's interesting Oh, we're Are we done? done? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Sorry. Okay, guys, thank you so much, Jada and Tiana, for being part thank of Tech Thanks, guys. Thank you.